सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली सो अनादर ईयर कम्स टू एन एंड and another is about to begin let's look back at the year that was and try and look forward but number 1 narendra modi let's not kid ourselves mr modi was the winner of the year this was the year he consolidated his power and he made it clear particularly after the assembly elections in chatisgarh rajasthan and madhya pradesh that he is almost certainly coming back to power next year and he's going to have a virtually unprecedented continuous third term now many people believed that mr modi once he had two terms once he established his supremacy over india would aim in his third term to be less absolute in his power to be somewhat gentler to be somewhat softer to be a great unifier to bring india together and to ensure what his place in history was well judging by what he's done this year this is wrong yes mr modi probably is coming back but no you're not getting a warmer cuddlier gentler version of the prime minister you're getting pretty much the same sort of prime minister you've had for 10 years and possibly a more concentrated version of that prime minister just look at the way he's responded after the elections look at the way parliament was disrupted by the suspension of what two thirds of the opposition this is not a mr modi who has much patience with his critics wants to go down as a unifying figure he's quite happy being divisive polarizing whatever you want to call him he's happy with his place in history as it is and so you're going to get more of the same so that's number 1 number 2 i think there is a problem and that problem is regional if you look at mr modi's successes almost all of them come from the hindi belt yes this assam is an outlier but essentially he wins every general election because he is like it or not undefeatable in the hindi belt he wins every assembly election and they rush to victory in every general election as well so if mr modi is so strong in the hindi belt what does it mean for the rest of india well it means he's not necessarily that strong everywhere else in bengal you will remember he campaigned incessantly he threw everything he had into the campaign and mamta banerjee won a landslide More recently you remember in the Karnataka election he again campaigned incessantly the BJP's had a presence in Karnataka for a while and it was believed that the mixture of that presence and Mr Modi's charisma would guarantee victory actually it didn't the Congress won so there are states that remain immune to his charm Punjab has remained resolutely an un Modi un BJP state his charm works in places like Maharashtra to some extent but never with the same fervor people demonstrate when they support him in the hindi belt so what you're going to get is a leader who rules the hindi belt and therefore rules india this is not necessarily unusual it's long been said that he who rules the hindi belt rules india we forget that in 1977 when we talk about this great janta landslide actually the janta party only really won the hindi belt indira gandhi won the south In 1989 when Rajiv Gandhi lost power the victory was essentially in the north of India in the Hindi belt the congress did okay in the south so what we are seeing is a repetition of that pattern now it's a repetition with a difference in that nobody has done it for as long as Mr Modi has inevitably there will be problems for better or for worse the bjp is always been seen as a hindi belt party and that's right from the jansang days it was believed that mr modi came to office he would be able to bridge that gap he would be able to turn it into a truly national party and to some limited extent as sam for instance he has succeeded karnataka was a sort of bjp supporting state even before 
But in the rest of India, no, I don't think he succeeded. The BJP is still largely a party that is at its strongest in the Hindi belt. If a person whose support comes from one part of India insists on being an absolute ruler, and Mr. Modi is nothing if not absolute, then how is the rest of India going to react? You're already hearing about a north-south divide. You've had Mamta Banerjee make criticisms of Delhi. I think over the next five years, unless Mr. Modi changes his approach, this is going to increase. There are going to be more divisions, more problems from the states, more problems particularly in South India, where people are going to argue that the government in Delhi doesn't really represent their interests. That's two. Three, what happens to Congress? Where does it fit into all of this? Well, the short answer is it's not clear. For a long time, we've all blamed Rahul Gandhi for the Congress's problems. And I think much of the criticism is valid and fair. I think Rahul Gandhi fought a terrible campaign with that Chokidar Chorhe slogan, which never took off. I think he behaved irresponsibly by resigning as Congress president. No elections took place. He continued as an extra constitutional authority. So yes, many of the criticisms are valid. But if this year taught us anything, it is that the Congress's problems go beyond one family. They go beyond one individual. For a long time, we've been told by political journalists, you know, the problem with the Congress is the Gandhis dominate everything. They're such strong state leaders, people who work on the ground, who understand the states, who understand elections. Why doesn't the Congress give them a chance? Well, they have a chance. Kharge, Malukarajun Kharge, who is the current Congress president, is a strong president, is a regional leader with a base. In the assembly elections, Madhya Pradesh was all Kamarnath and Digvijay Singh. Rajasthan was Ashok Gehlot. Chhattisgarh was Bhupesh Baghel. Yes, Rahul did campaign, but it was clear that these people were calling the shots, handing out the tickets. And we know what happened. So there is a problem. I think the Congress's problems are that it hasn't been able to work out how to defeat Mr. Modi or even how to oppose him. It hasn't found a slogan. It hasn't found a position that resonates with India. And as long as it's continually wiped out in the Hindi belt, there is no hope it can ever come to power in the center. If the Congress continues this way, we are still looking at 40 to 50 seats at the next parliamentary election. So the next few months are crucial for the Congress. Can it revive? Can it find a way of opposing Mr. Modi? So far, the evidence suggests it can't. That's three. Four, foreign policy. Uh, you remember a country called Pakistan? I ask because you don't hear that much about it now, do you? I remember in the early days of Mr. Modi, everything was Pakistan's fault. Pakistan was this existential threat to India. Pakistan was our deadly enemy. Pakistan was sending terrorists. All of us who had views that were different from BJP trolls were essentially Pakistanis. The favorite abuse of BJP trolls was go to Pakistan. Some of this, of course, a lot of it, was an attempt to attack the Indian Muslim minority by subconsciously connecting them with Pakistan. But here's the thing. It's all gone. No? Do you hear about Pakistan now? When is the last time anybody asked you or me to go to Pakistan? Do you even see that slogan on social media? Do you hear government ministers talking about Pakistan? Are the electronic channels, which pretty much do what the government says, going on and on about Pakistan? No. There's been a change of approach when it comes to foreign policy or even domestic policy. The BJP is no longer focusing on Pakistan. Why? Could it be that diminishing returns have set in? Could it be that nobody believes Pakistan, given the mess it is in, is really a threat to India? Could it be that we don't want to attract too much attention or draw too much attention towards Pakistan, towards our border dispute? towards what's going on in Kashmir? I don't know. But there's certainly a change of stance there. China. Now, you remember when Mr. Modi came to office, he hosted Chinese leaders. A lot was said about a new era of India-China relations. Well, that's gone wrong very quickly. Not only is it clear the Chinese don't want to be our friends, it's also clear they don't like us very much. And that this hostility translates into military action.
However much the government tries to not to talk about it, it's clear that there are things happening on the border that are not entirely in India's interest. It's clear the Chinese have been more successful in the border area than we are willing to let on. We've been able to translate this Chinese hostility, I think that's to the credit of our foreign policy establishment, into an advantage. We've presented ourselves to the West as the last bulwark against Chinese domination. If you don't support us, we've told America and the rest of the West, you're stuck with China, so we are your best bet. It's a good policy and to an extent it's true, but it doesn't make much difference at the border where the Chinese are ensconced and there will be trouble going forward. Now, people are very critical of the Modi Jai Shankar foreign policy, but I think much of that criticism is unfair. They've actually done okay. One instance where they managed to pull off something I thought was going to be difficult was the Ukraine war. If you remember America and the West took a you're with us or you're against us kind of position. India said, no, we will continue to do business with Russia. We will continue to buy oil. Russia is our friend. And yes, we want to be friends with you as well. There were huge, huge criticisms all over, but we got away with it. We're still friends with America. Mr. Putin has just said to Jay Shankar how much he loves India. We've managed to walk that tightrope. There's another tightrope we walk, which people don't seem to realize, and that's to do with the conflict in Gaza. It's no secret that Mr. Modi is quite keen on Israel, on the current leadership of Israel, on the people who make Pegasus, etc. But we've traditionally always been friends with the Islamic world. We've had many, many years of good relations with Arab countries. Now, at a time when individual politicians in the West the media are all writing about this government's mistreatment, shall we say, of our Muslim minority, you would think that there would be some difficulty in maintaining that relationship with the Arab world. The extraordinary thing is, no, there hasn't been. Relations between India and the Islamic world are better than they've ever been. How do you explain this? Well, there's only one cynical explanation. It's now clear that the Arab world cares about Islam, but it doesn't really care about Indian Muslims. If you attack Islam, then yes, they will be upset. We saw the spectacle of a BJP spokesperson who said on television the sort of things these people say in private all the time. There was a huge uproar. The Arab world objected and the Indian government obligingly threw her overboard, called her a fringe element and said, no, no, we're very sorry, but we have nothing to do with this person, which I think everyone knew was a lie, but it was in everyone's interest to go ahead. Can we maintain this balance? Can Mr. Modi continue to be great friends with Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel? And can we continue to be friends with the Arab world? Oddly enough, it looks like we can. I think that's whatever you may think of the government, one huge success of our foreign policy. We walked tight ropes and we've made it work. There's one tightrope I think we've fallen off. It was okay when Justin Trudeau accused us of plotting to kill Khalistanis because, you know, Trudeau has often made irresponsible remarks before. He never had any evidence for this claim, or if he did, he never made it in public. Khalistanis have found refuge in Canada and have over the years plotted against India. So perhaps we had a right to be upset about that. But the American allegation, it's an indictment now, it's no longer an allegation, suggesting that an official of the Indian government got a middleman, an underworld figure, to try and hire a hitman to kill a Khalistani leader in America is serious. It's interesting also that unlike the Canadian allegation, which we poo-pooed, we have not denied this. We've only said we're investigating. So you've got what? This government going around trying to assassinate Khalistanis on foreign soil. It's the sort of thing that America is okay with if you go off and kill a terrorist in some country where the rule of law does not apply. But the Americans were never going to be happy with Indians hiring assassins to operate on their soil. And yet we went ahead and did it. When you think about it, it's so much at odds with the rest of our foreign policy, it's almost as though our external security has been handed over to the Punjab police and they're going ahead with an encounters policy. 
We're in trouble on that one. And I think we will be in trouble with America, no matter how much we say we're a bulwark against China, unless we sort that out quickly. So what do we look forward to in the year ahead? Well, more of the same. I don't see any dramatic changes. I see Mr. Modi coming back to power. I don't see the softer, gentler Modi we talked about. I see him getting perhaps even more extreme in his positions, even less willing to listen to his critics. That's the India of the next year. Happy New Year.